Welcome to part four of Robert L. Belknap's journey through the brothers Karamazov. Now we have ended our focus on the inherent structure and the plot and will instead focus on the narrative structure. The first chapter in this narrative structure part is about the indistinct narrator. In part four, the narrative structure, the final exploration of Robert L. Belknap's examination of the brothers Karamazov, we delve into the intricacies of the novel's narration, highlighting the unique way Dostoevsky blurs the lines between the narrator and the narrative itself. Belknap discusses the indistinct narrator, a pivotal aspect of the novel that melds pure narration with narrative through imitation, a technique that echoes the epic tradition where the poet narrates both directly and through the guise of characters. Dostoevsky's narrator, never stepping out of character, employs a pseudo-epic form, narrating the entire saga through a fabricated persona that interacts with the story purely on a mnemonic basis. This narrative choice serves to bridge the gap between creation and expression, making the narrative flow more acceptable and relatable to the reader by presenting the world of the Karamazovs as remembered rather than directly created. This approach contrasts sharply with modern narratives that often involve the reader in the creative process, emphasizing instead a clear separation between the narrator's recounting of events and the author's act of creation. The narrator exists within the novel's world, yet stands apart from it, functioning as a chronicler whose primary attribute is his vast, remembered knowledge of the events and characters. This existence is hinted at through subtle suggestions of physical presence and personal reactions within the narrative, particularly during pivotal scenes like the trial, where the narrator's emotional responses and second-hand accounts suggest a physical presence among the characters. Chronologically, the narrator's perspective is posthumous, narrating from a point in time when all events have concluded. This positioning allows for a narration that is rich with hindsight, imbuing the storytelling with a depth of memory and retrospection that transcends mere chronological recounting. Interestingly, the narrator's role and temporal stance are occasionally made explicit, providing insights into the scope of the novel and the discretion exercised in its telling. This is notably exemplified in a passage where the narrator reflects on the significance of a seemingly trivial meeting and its implications for a character's future, illustrating the narrator's influence over the narrative's breadth. Belknap's analysis of the narrative structure in The Brothers Karamazov reveals Dostoevsky's masterful manipulation of narrative voice and perspective, showcasing how the indistinct narrator not only serves as a bridge between the story and the reader, but also plays a crucial role in the novel's complex exploration of themes, character development and causal connections. In dissecting the brothers Karamazov, Robert L. Belknap draws attention to the narrative structure, particularly the enigmatic figure of the narrator, whose identity remains veiled throughout. This indistinctness is a deliberate choice by Fyodor Dostoevsky, allowing the narrative to oscillate between direct storytelling and the complex inner worlds of its characters. This is clear already from the outset in Chapter 1 of Book 1. In most cases, people, even the most vicious, are much more naive and simple-minded than we assume them to be, and this is true of ourselves too. This early assertion invites scrutiny of the narrator's reliability, a theme further explored by Dostoevsky scholars. This is not a case of someone being naive and simple-minded. Instead, this seems to be a case of someone being complicated and contradictory. The complexity of the narrative voice is further exemplified in Book 9, where Ivan's delirium blurs the lines between reality and hallucination. Upon leaving the doctor, however, Ivan wisely ignored his advice and did not put himself in the doctor's hands. As long as I'm strong enough to walk around, I'll do so. When I can no longer stand on my feet and have to stay in bed, let them give me any medical treatment they can think of, he decided, dismissing his illness with a shrug. And so he sat now, realizing full well that he was delirious, with his eyes focused, as I've already mentioned, on that point, on the sofa opposite him. Now there was someone sitting in that spot, God knows how he'd got in because he hadn't been in the room 
when Ivan first got home from Smerdyakov's. This passage blends the narrator with Ivan and Ivan's hallucination, meaning we soon don't know who is talking and how the narrator can be there to document this. But that is the beauty of Dostoevsky's work. It reminds us that our own lives too are a polyphony, echoing Bakhtin's notion that our existence is filled with multiple voices, often making it challenging to discern which one is truly ours. Belknap's analysis of his scope and mode of awareness in The Brothers Karamazov illuminates the intricate dance between the narrator's relationship with the story's characters and their internal worlds. The narrator, existing both within and outside of Dostoevsky's crafted universe, wields no power to alter events, embodying an unobserved observer. This narrative choice challenges conventional boundaries, allowing the story to unfold through a blend of direct narration and the varied perspectives of characters who often take on the role of secondary or even tertiary narrators themselves. One of Belknap's critical insights is the flexibility of the narrator's awareness, which vacillates across a spectrum of intimacy with the character's thoughts, feelings and motivations. Early in the novel, the focus is predominantly on Alyosha, offering deep dives into his psyche before pivotal encounters. This narrative focus shifts, granting Ivan and Dmitri similar treatment as their stories unfold, marking a deliberate transition of insight that mirrors the character's evolving journeys. Belknap highlights the narrator's method of setting scenes, initially providing comprehensive backgrounds and character states before retracting to a more observational role, akin to a play's audience. This retreat is strategic, emphasizing dialogue and actions over internal musings and allowing the character's words and deeds to resonate more profoundly with the reader. Notably, Belknap points out the defiance of traditional narrative consistency in The Brothers Karamazov. The narrator's perspective jumps, sometimes offering omniscient judgments and insights, and at other times retracting to a behavioristic portrayal of events. This fluidity challenges the reader's expectations and underscores the novel's thematic depth, exploring faith, doubt, freedom and redemption through a multifaceted narrative lens. In his exploration of The Brothers Karamazov, Robert L. Belknap sheds light on the indistinct and multifaceted role of the narrator, a figure who intricately weaves through the consciousness of the characters, bridging the realms of pure narration and mimetic dialogue. This complexity allows the reader to delve deeper into the characters' inner lives, embodying Dostoevsky's narrative genius in presenting layered human experiences. A poignant illustration of this narrative depth is found in the recollections of Elder Zosima's life. I recall coming into his room once when no one else was there. It was a clear evening, the sun was setting, and the whole room was lighted by its slanting rays. He beckoned me to him when he saw me. I walked over to him, and he put his hands on my shoulders. He looked tenderly and lovingly into my eyes and continued to look at me in that manner for a whole minute, perhaps, without saying anything. All right, he said in the end. Now go and play and live some of life for me. This passage, rich in sensory detail and emotional resonance, transcends simple narrative to evoke a profound sense of connection and insight. Through the eyes of Alyosha, we are granted access to Zosima's gentle wisdom and loving nature, illustrating not just the character's depth, but also the narrator's ability to shift perspective and depth of insight. This technique enriches the narrative, inviting readers to engage with the story on multiple levels and to reflect on the themes of life, love, and the passage of time. In The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky's narrative intertwines with the plot, weaving a complex fabric of characters who oscillate between human motivations and symbolic representations. Robert L. Belknap notes the pivotal role of the narrator's fluctuating awareness in shaping reader perceptions, transforming characters from deeply human to allegorical figures and vice versa. The narrative shifts from intimate psychological insights to mere external observations, exemplified by characters like Zosima, who transcends his human traits to embody spiritual wisdom, and Smerdyakov, who emerges as a figure of nihilism, 
his actions echoing larger, darker themes beyond personal flaws. The transformations of the Karamazov brothers are central to this narrative technique. Ivan's journey from an externally observed character to a deeply troubled soul teetering on the edge of madness illustrates this shift, leaving his spiritual fate uncertain. Mitya transitions from a representation of raw Karamazov sensuality to a character of redemption, his inner narrative illuminating his path to change. Alyosha's portrayal evolves from a complex individual to a symbol of grace, marked by the narrator's retreat from probing into his psyche, signaling a shift towards a symbolic interpretation of his character. This dual narrative perspective enriches the novel, allowing characters to be understood both as intricate personalities and as figures representing broader existential themes. Dostoevsky's narrative structure not only drives the plot but deepens the thematic exploration, engaging readers in a dynamic interpretive process. In the intricate narrative of the brothers Karamazov, characters are not only pivotal to the unfolding of the plot, but also serve as embodiments of deeper, existential themes. Following Belknap's analysis of how the narrative and plot structures parallel each other, another compelling example emerges through the character of Grigory Vasilyevich Kutuzov. This example further illustrates Dostoevsky's mastery in weaving complex character dynamics that reflect broader moral and ethical considerations. To indicate how far he went, I will mention that Gregory, the dour, stupid, argumentative old servant who had hated his former mistress Adelaida, now took Sophia's side, stood up for her, and swore back at his master in a manner that was quite intolerable from a servant. Once he even broke up a party and drove the guests and the women out of the house. Grigory's defiance and moral stand against his master, Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov, underscore the novel's exploration of loyalty, justice, and moral integrity. In standing up for Sofia Ivanovna, despite the societal and personal risks, Grigory transcends his role as a mere servant to become a symbol of unwavering moral principle. This act of defiance is not only a significant plot point, but also a moment where a secondary character embodies a thematic counterpoint to the moral ambiguities and conflicts that plague the Karamazov family. In his analysis of the brothers Karamazov, Robert L. Belknap delves into Dostoevsky's adept use of narrative techniques, specifically focusing on the strategic withholding and selective presentation of information. This approach not only captivates the reader, but also meticulously guides their focus and expectations throughout the narrative, enriching the novel's depth and the engagement it demands. Belknap highlights the nuanced way the narrator interjects emotional responses directly into the narrative. For example, the use of alas in various contexts subtly conveys the narrator's empathy or detachment towards characters and their predicaments. These insertions, whether expressing regret over Mitya's unarticulated feelings during his preliminary investigation or depicting Kolya's childish despair over his height, serve more than mere narrative embellishments. They draw the reader deeper into the emotional landscape of the story, revealing the complex interplay between the plot's straightforward events and the rich undercurrents of character motivation and psychological depth. Moreover, Belknap's analysis brings to light the narrator's manipulation of information through omission, strategic delay, and selective revelation, crafting what Belknap describes as an ill-made novel. This technique disrupts conventional narrative expectations illustrated by the casual, almost playful revelation of the town's name, Skotoprigonievsk, and the delayed introduction or unexpected background details of characters, such as the surprising familial relationship between Grushenka and Rakitin. Through these examples, Belknap elucidates how Dostoevsky's narrative discretion not only builds suspense, but also mirrors the novel's broader themes of fate, free will, and the interconnectedness of human lives. The narrator's whimsical control over information, coupled with moments of unexpected revelation, introduces a sense of life's unpredictability and the dense tapestry of its stories.
A pertinent quote that illustrates the theme of withholding and selecting information in The Brothers Karamazov, distinct from Belknap's analysis, is found in the Defense Council's argument regarding the non-existence of the stolen money. This excerpt highlights how Dostoevsky skillfully uses the narrative to manipulate the information available to the reader and characters within the story, thereby deepening the intrigue and complexity of the plot. One point in the Defense Council's speech surprised everyone, and that was his categorical denial of the very existence of the fatal 3,000 rubles and hence of the possibility of their having been stolen. Any unprejudiced outsider, Fetyukovich started his argument, will be struck by the fact that besides murder, the accused in this case is also charged with robbery, although it could never be proved exactly what was stolen. It has been said that money was stolen, namely 3,000 rubles, but no one knows for a fact that the money actually existed. This passage exemplifies Dostoevsky's ingenious narrative strategy of withholding crucial information to create suspense and provoke thought about the nature of truth and evidence. It serves as a clear demonstration of the novel's exploration of doubt, perception, and the elusive nature of reality, underscoring the complexity of the narrative structure and the depth of its thematic concerns. Belknap illuminates Dostoevsky's nuanced use of secondary narrators in The Brothers Karamazov to enrich the narrative beyond its main plot and deepen thematic exploration. These narrators introduce peripheral yet thematically significant anecdotes, such as Grushenka's story of the onion, which adds layers of meaning around redemption and grace. Secondary voices also enhance the impact of events by aligning with narrators who share thematic affinities, like Fyodor's recounting of the von Zohn murder, thus intensifying the narrative's emotional resonance. A pivotal function of these narrators is presenting conflicting viewpoints on key events, particularly the murder of Fyodor Pavlovich. This approach not only engages readers in the quest for truth, but also reveals the subjective nature of understanding and judgment. The diverse narratives, such as the accounts of Dmitri's assault on Captain Snegiryov, unveil characters' biases and moral orientations. Through these varied narrations, Dostoevsky invites reflection on the nature of truth and the complexity of its pursuit, showcasing how personal perspectives can obscure reality. Additionally, employing secondary narrators to cover different time periods like Zosima's past reflections adds depth and showcases the transformation of characters. In summary, Belknap showcases Dostoevsky's strategic use of secondary narrators to weave moral and philosophical themes into the narrative fabric. This technique offers a deeper engagement with the text's ethical and existential questions, illustrating the challenges in discerning truth amidst human subjectivity. In The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky's narrative sophistication extends beyond the use of a primary narrator to incorporate a multitude of perspectives that deepen the novel's exploration of existential themes. This technique is especially evident in the treatment of Ivan Fyodorovich Karamazov's profound existential crisis. An exemplary manifestation of this narrative depth is observed in the pivotal moment leading to the climax, where a subtle shift in narrative perspective underscores the complexity of Ivan's internal struggle. Although I am not a doctor, I feel that at this point I must give the reader at least some idea of the nature of Ivan's illness. I will anticipate somewhat and say that the following day Ivan was to succumb completely to the brain fever which he had been incubating for a long time, but which his organism had stubbornly resisted. Knowing very little about medicine, I will only risk the assumption that perhaps he had succeeded in delaying the sickness by a desperate effort of will, although, of course, he could not avoid it altogether. This narrative passage exemplifies Dostoevsky's nuanced use of multiple narrators, delving into Ivan's psyche in a manner that suggests the narrative voice is almost reflecting Ivan's perspective in retrospect. By employing a dialectical style, where each statement nuances or qualifies the preceding one, Dostoevsky enriches the narrative with a layered insight into Ivan's inner world, 
at a juncture where even soul seems to resist full comprehension even by an omniscient narrator. In the final chapter of Robert L. Belknap's book, he delves into the nuanced use of tertiary and quaternary narrators in The Brothers Karamazov, further demonstrating Dostoevsky's narrative complexity. This intricate layering is showcased in a memorable scene involving Alyosha and Snegiryov, where the narrative first unfolds through the primary narrator and is then retold by Alyosha. The scene in question, wherein Snegiryov initially accepts 200 rubles only to later trample them underfoot, initially comes across as mechanically driven by perverse self-will, potentially rendering it a weak moment in Dostoevsky's narrative. However, Dostoevsky does not leave the anecdote unresolved. Alyosha retelling to Lise breathes life into the scene, offering psychological depth and transforming it into a comprehensible psychological reality rather than a mere dramatic device. Alyosha's insight into Snegirev's conflicting emotions, the foreboding and the forced sense of rejection juxtaposed with his overwhelming joy and readiness to accept the money, illuminates the intricate dance of human psychology. This layering of narrative perspectives enhances the scene's impact, making it a pivotal psychological exploration rather than a straightforward narrative moment. This method of inserting extra narrators serves multiple purposes. From enhancing the narrative's psychological and philosophical depth to bridging the human with the absolute, thus allowing Dostoevsky to weave together the human and divine within the same novelistic tapestry, the tertiary and quaternary narrators act as mediators, enabling a dialogue between the human and the absolute, whether isolating or uniting these realms. This structural choice imbues the narrative with a profound depth showcasing Dostoevsky's ability to explore the intricacies of the human condition while engaging with existential absolutes, ultimately offering a richer, more layered reading experience. As Belknap discusses, Dostoevsky employs tertiary narrators like Fyodor Pavlovich to retell events, adding their own interpretation and embellishment. He also utilizes quaternary narrators like the listening audience to add further layers of commentary and perception. This creates multifaceted narration that enriches the philosophical dimensions, as shown in this example from Book One. He even seemed to enjoy, indeed to feel flattered by, his ridiculous role as a cuckolded husband, for he insisted on describing his own disgrace in minute detail, even embellishing on it. Why, Fyodor Pavlovich, people remarked, you act as if an honor had been bestowed upon you, you seem pleased despite your sorrow. Many even added that he was delighted to have the role of clown thrust upon him, that he only pretended to be unaware of his ridiculous position in order to make it even funnier, but who can really tell? Possibly he was quite ingenuous about it all. In this passage, the primary narrator describes Fyodor Pavlovich sharing details of being a cuckolded husband and embellishing on his disgrace to others. Fyodor acts as a tertiary narrator, retelling and embroidering the events around his wife's infidelity and his ridiculous role for an audience. The listeners form a quaternary layer, remarking on how he seems pleased by the scandal and appears to enjoy the role of clown it affords him. Through these layered narratives, Dostoevsky provides insight into Fyodor Pavlovich's possible motivations and inner psychology. The multiple perspectives also engage readers in discerning the deeper symbolic meaning of his questionable actions. This showcases Dostoevsky's ability to use tertiary and quaternary narration to imbue scenes with philosophical complexity. Robert Belknap concludes his study by reflecting on the origins of the brothers Karamazov's intricate narrative structure. He notes that while some have seen the novel as an unfinished fragment, careful analysis reveals it to be a structurally complete masterpiece. The richly multi-layered form arises symbiotically with the novel's content during Dostoevsky's creative process. It is not the result of a preconceived overarching blueprint. Conscious artistic skills shaped the work, as did Dostoevsky's innate associations, cultivated literary techniques, and the traditions of the novel form. Crucially, Dostoevsky employs structure as an instrument of inclusion, 
diversifying perspectives through an abundance of secondary narrators and alternate dramatic scenes. This avoids limiting artistic choices, allowing philosophical depth and dramatic richness to coexist through juxtaposition rather than exclusion. This way, a multiplicity of subjective voices and clashing viewpoints are woven into an aesthetic whole. The novel's profound humanity emerges from the interplay between Dostoevsky's artistic wisdom, intuitive imagination and purpose during the act of creative selection. Structure and content evolve symbiotically, generating a masterful artistic vision. Belknap's study illuminates the sources and mechanisms behind the brothers Karamazov's intricate artistry. It reveals how Dostoevsky harnessed all facets of his genius to craft a novel of unprecedented philosophical insight into the human condition through pioneering narrative techniques. The result is a towering landmark of world literature. I thank you Dostoevsky lovers for staying with me to the end of this rewarding book. Take care.